Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Meeting House of Provincetown, where we affirm the inherent worth and dignity of every person, and where we support each other on our spiritual search for truth and meaning. My name is Reverend Kate Wilkinson, and I am so glad that you have joined us this morning. Welcome to those of you in the room, and welcome also to those joining us via our live stream. A special welcome to those of you watching together in the community room at Seashore Point. And welcome also to those of you who are here for Bear Week. Anyone here for Bear Week? Welcome, welcome. It's so good to be back with you. For those of you who don't know, I've been away at our denomination's National Gathering General Assembly. Our service this morning is a kind of recap of my time away and a sharing of some of the spiritual lessons that I learned on my journey. Some of the elements of our service, like the call to worship and the prayer, are ones that were offered at GA so that you can have a taste of it too. Before we begin our worship, though, I have just a few announcements to share. On Monday, the Mass Power Forward Coalition is hosting 11 mini-rallies on the 11th day of July at the 11th hour. These are happening all over the state to call on our legislators to wake up and do more for environmental and climate justice. The rallies will be calling for air quality, 100% renewable energy, and indigenous justice, efforts that have stalled out, particularly in the Massachusetts House of Representatives. We will be hosting one of those rallies on our lawn at 11 o'clock on Monday morning 
in partnership with UU Mass Action and the Sierra Club. So join us from 11 to 12 or just stop by and say hello. We are in need of pretty much everything for our food pantry this week except lasagna and cup of noodles. We're pretty set on those, but if you could bring other items, we would be grateful. The weekly craft fairs have resumed in AB Hall downstairs on Thursdays. Stop by and check out the work of some lovely local artists. Great Music at Five starts up again next week. The concert will be Curtain Up with favorite songs from great musicals presented by the Great Music at Five Broadway Ensemble. You don't want to miss it. A big thank you to Kurt Reynolds, who is providing the music this morning. <laughs> so lovely to hear the harp in this space again. And we send our love to our pianist, Brenda, who is caring for her elderly father this morning. And it looks like a beautiful day out there, so I invite those of you who are attending in person to join us out on the lawn after our service for our coffee hour. And now let's continue by affirming our community's covenant. I invite you to repeat each line after me. Love is the spirit of this meeting house. This is our great covenant. To dwell together in peace. To seek the truth in love and to help one another. As we deepen into our time of worship, I offer these opening words by Gretchen Haley, which she offered at the final worship service at GA. Come now across platforms and practices to declare with joy our resilience to proclaim on purpose, we have survived the pandemics of our time. We have survived, we are surviving. We have pivoted and we have planned and we have replanned and then thrown all plans to the wind. In this circle, we will declare without shame some days we lost our way. And some days, we lost our passwords. <laughs> and we have not always been our best selves. We are learning, not always quickly, to regroup and remember perfection was never the point. We are here because we long to try again, to promise with people to be partners in this long haul work of loving and becoming, even while we grieve also the cost, which is not small and lingers in our hearts and turns only sometimes into rage. Here, let your body tell the truth. Shake free the stories that live in your skin. Breathe in your beauty. Breathe out your burdens. Breathe in our beauty. Breathe out our burdens. Be here with it all, with all of us in the freedom of this new day. This new day, it dawns for us all. Come, let us worship together. At this time, I invite Kate to light our chalice for us. As we light our chalice here in the sanctuary, I invite those of you watching online to light a candle wherever you are. In this way, we can feel connected even while we are apart.
Please join me now in a spirit of meditation and prayer. If you have a joy or a sorrow on your heart this morning, you are welcome to light a silent candle during the prayer or at any time during the service at the table to the right of the pulpit. And there is a journal there to record your thoughts and prayers. Our prayer this morning is by Sherry Halliday Kwan, and it was offered during the Sunday morning worship service at General Assembly. We are flying through space at a thousand miles an hour, and still the earth holds us steady. I am told that when you have been carrying a baby outside your body, holding a beloved and rocking them, you sometimes find yourself rocking all on your own, being rocked, caring for creation. I know a preacher who sways back and forth on the street corner or in the pulpit, rocking, being rocked, loving into being our co-creation. Spirit of life, divine mother of many names and one abundant love, we come to this moment from many places, thousands of stories, thousands of storms, flying 1,000 miles an hour on this one rock. We come full of ideas and excitement, new connections. We come with rage, fear, loneliness. We come with something to give. We come needing something, but not even sure of what that is. And even if we are overwhelmed by all of this, we are so grateful to be here. So grateful to be alive. Grateful for the people who surround us. We give thanks for this moment. Let us rest here in your embrace. Like those who have come before, like the person I was last year, like the you of one hour from now, and the community that we used to be, we are all always changing. The ancestors called into this place. They were far from perfect, and even with the head start on their mistakes, we have not learned all the lessons. As people and communities, our courage flickers and falters. Here in the witness of community, we open to the truth that we do not always get it right. We call to mind the moments when we have failed to live out our deepest values, when we've been mean-spirited or selfish, when we've been complicit, sometimes for survival, with white supremacy and systems of oppression, when we have done harm, even unknowingly, to our beloveds. Here in the witness of community, we know and name that there are those among us who have been hurt. We have not and are not always treated right. Many of us carry invisible wounds from our communities, our ancestors, our churches, our beloveds, and our faith. May the terms of forgiveness be ours. May our shared experience be a blessing. May we find new pathways to healing. For we contain multitudes. Growth is a messy affair, imperfect and unceasing. May rest offer the chance to form new connections, our brains, and our relationships and our stories nurtured in darkness. We open to this day. 
In this loving embrace, may we find an ease that tempts us not into shutting out the world, not denying it, not fixing it all by ourselves. Lead us to rest, to be held, to hold, not to know, to try anyway, to love, to take delight, to rise again and again, to co-create the world. May we find this place and this people of welcome and belonging. May we be that place and those people. Amen. Spirit of life, come unto me, sing in my heart all the stirrings of compassion, blow in the wind, rise in the sea, move in my hands, giving life Life the shape of justice. Roots hold me close, wings set me free. Spirit of life, come to me, come to me. It doesn't say who. Okay, sorry. This reading is called Hierarchy of Needs. Human beings are motivated by a hierarchy of needs. Needs are organized in a hierarchy in which more basic needs must be more or less met prior to higher needs. The order of needs is not rigid, but instead may be flexible based on external circumstances or individual differences. Most behavior is multi-motivated, that is, simultaneously determined by more than one basic need. In 1943, American psychologist Abraham Maslow developed a hierarchy of five human needs that has become an important teaching tool for psychologists, educators, and social scientists. Before his death in 1970, Maslow expanded his five-stage model to include cognitive and aesthetic needs and later transcendence needs. The full eight-stage model is this. Number one, biological and physical, physiological needs, air, food, drink, shelter, warmth, sex, and sleep. Two, safety needs, protection from elements, security, order, law, stability, freedom from fear. Three, love and belongingness needs, friendship, intimacy, trust and acceptance, receiving and giving affection and love, affiliating, being part of a group, family, friends, work. Four, 
esteem needs, which Maslow classified into two categories, esteem for oneself, dignity, achievement, mastery, independence, and the need to be accepted and valued by others, status, prestige. Five, cognitive needs, knowledge and understanding, curiosity, exploration, need for meaning and predictability. Six, aesthetic needs, appreciation and search for beauty, balance, form. Seven, self-actualization needs, realizing personal potential, self-fulfillment, seeking personal growth and peak experiences, a desire to become everything one is capable of becoming. Eight, transcendence needs. A person is motivated by values which transcend beyond the personal self, mystical experiences, and certain experiences with nature, aesthetic experiences, sexual experiences, service to others, the pursuit of science, religious faith. In 1943, Maslow said, it is quite true that man lives by bread alone when there is no bread. But what happens to man's desires when there is plenty of bread and when his belly is chronically filled? At once and higher needs emerge and these, rather than physiological hungers, dominate the organism. And when these in turn are satisfied, again new and still higher needs emerge and so on. This is what we mean by saying the basic human needs are organized into a hierarchy of relative prepotency. Maslow initially stated that individuals must satisfy lower level needs before progressing on to meet higher level growth needs. However, he later clarified that satisfaction of a need is not an all or none phenomenon. Modern researchers agree, saying that through examining cultures in which large numbers of people live in poverty, it is clear that people are certainly still capable of higher order needs such as love and belongingness. Psychologists now conceptualize motivation as a pluralistic behavior whereby needs can operate on many levels simultaneously. They're like vitamins, one researcher said. We need them all. Now is the time in our service where we take a collection for the ongoing support of this meeting house and our shared ministry. As we enjoy a musical reflection, we welcome your donations here in the sanctuary or online through PayPal or Venmo. You can find that information on our website, uumh.org. On and off site, your offerings will now be gratefully received. Standing on these mountains and plains Far away from the rolling ocean Still my dry heart land can say I've been sailing all my life now Never harbor or port have I known The wide universe It's the ocean I travel 
And the world is my blue boat home Sun's my sail And moon my rudder As I ply the starry sky Leaning o'er the edge in wonder Casting questions into the deep Drifting here with my ship's companions All you kindred pilgrim souls Making our way by the light of heaven in our beautiful blue boat home I give thanks to the waves upholding me hail these great winds urging me on greet the infinite stars with wonder as I sing my sailor's song. Traveling here with my ship's companions, all you pilgrim kindred souls, Making our way by the light of heaven In our beautiful blue boat home So I mentioned that this service is going to be a kind of recap of my trip out to General Assembly. I should tell you that GA this year was held in Portland, Oregon. And I'll be honest, that was a big part of why I decided to go. I don't go to GA every year because it's quite expensive and because I'm an introvert. <laughs> And while reconnecting with colleagues and friends and taking a workshop or two is lovely, hanging out with thousands of other Unitarians in a convention center and attending a week's worth of workshops and business meetings quickly becomes overwhelming to me. But it's been three years since I've traveled anywhere. I haven't seen some of my dear minister colleagues in ages. And I have always wanted to go to Portland. Also, one of my best friends, Liz, is a Presbyterian minister in Portland, and I wanted to tack on a few days visiting with her and her family after the conference was over. In addition to looking at the General Assembly program and picking out some key things that I wanted to experience, I also had a must-do list for visiting Portland. I wanted to eat at a food truck. I wanted to drive through the different neighborhoods to see the funky architecture. I wanted to visit Mad Hannah's, which is a bar that another friend of mine owns. I wanted to visit a small permaculture farm that I follow on YouTube. I wanted to go to Powell's Books, the world's largest independent bookstore. And I wanted to get an ice cream cone at Salt and Straw, a really funky Portland ice cream shop that has bizarre flavors like black tea and deviled egg or chicken and waffles. 
The four, you can't stop thinking about that one, can you? The four things that I was really looking forward to at General Assembly were attending every worship service I could, because ministers rarely get to just attend worship. We're always leading it, which isn't the same. Hearing a conversation with Adrienne Marie Brown, an author and activist that I really love, going to the WHERE lecture, which is a lecture that has happened with different renowned speakers since 1922. Some folks who have addressed the UU General Assembly at the WHERE lecture in the past have been Mary Oliver, Kurt Vonnegut, and Martin Luther King Jr. This year, the speaker was Dr. Ibram Kendi, whose number one New York Times best-selling book is called How to Be an Anti-Racist. And finally, I was excited to vote in this year's uh, election for UUA Board of Trustees. Now, I'm not usually so excited to vote for positions in UUA leadership. I'll be honest. At times, these elections are not even on my radar. But it was an important vote this year because two of the Board of Trustee positions were actually contested elections, meaning that the nominating committee of the UUA had put forward their two candidates for the board, but two other people ended up running against them, nominated by petition, all part of our democratic process. The folks running by petition represent a small faction of UUs who believe that Unitarian Universalism is going in the wrong direction. Our focus these last few years has been to center the marginalized voices in our faith, to be accountable to them, and to do a lot of self-examination about how our individual and collective behaviors and norms have upheld the patterns of white supremacy culture, rather than living into the liberatory and multicultural faith that we have the potential to be, and for many years have claimed that we already are. While we have for decades been guided by our seven principles, which talk about the inherent worth and dignity of every person, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations, respect for the interdependent web of existence. Recently, an eighth principle has been proposed, which directly reflects this work that we have been engaging in. It says, we, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote journeying toward spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. Now, just like when we began to center women's rights and LGBTQ rights earlier in our history, some folks are troubled by this focus on anti-racism, saying that we don't need to talk about it so darn much and that things were working just fine before. One of these petition candidates even said in her platform, UUs have always been welcoming of other perspectives and opinions, but then went on to say, I acknowledge the desire of many, especially younger and or marginalized identifying members, to take our religion in a profoundly different direction. I believe this is the wrong approach. I wholeheartedly support helping another branch of UUism to be formed that is more attractive to the aforementioned folks. <laughs> it gets better. <laughs> Maybe named 21st century UUs. <laughs> 
So basically, these candidates want Unitarian Universalism to stay in the 20th century, which it should be noted has come and gone, people. <laughs> they want to welcome other perspectives and opinions so long as they don't ever need to question or change their own or make any other changes to the institution that has always served them quite nicely. And they think that marginalized groups and young people should go off and form their own faith instead of influencing theirs. So heck yeah, I was excited to vote against them. <laughs> and I did. And we did. And they lost. And the candidates that were actually vetted and nominated by the UUA won by 90%. A strong and decisive vote to live in the actual 21st century and look to the future with dreams of being all that we can be. But not a 100% vote. We should note that. Not a 100% vote. And the worships were wonderful and filled my soul. And Adrienne Marie Brown was as amazing as I hoped she would be. Our congregation's president, Will, and I sat together for her talk, and we both took some notes during it. I don't know what he wrote down, but here are a few of the quotes that stuck out for me, some of which seemed particularly apt for the moment. She said, you can't crawl backwards through space and time to the way things used to be. You can't crawl backward through space and time to the way things used to be. And she said, what are we longing for? What does accountability look like in this time? How do we move through change together? And she said, the quality of relationships determines if the structure is strong or fragile. We are going to make mistakes. We're not always going to get it right, and we are going to hurt one another. But when mistakes are made and you can say, I trust you, then it's different. Then you can move beyond the mistakes and stay in relationship and heal what is broken and the structure holds. But if those relationships aren't there, then the structure will be fragile. And when something goes wrong, it will crumble. What are the problems in our community that need the medicine of our collective imagination, she asked. And when asked what is getting her through these difficult times, she answered, boundaries and altars. She went on to say that although she is an activist who is completely committed to making the world a better place for all its people, when the stress and the pressure and the relentless news cycle and the constant connectedness press in on her, she turns off social media and she lights a candle and she tends to her soul so that she can wake up in the morning having preserved that spark of light within herself, which she knows is good for the world, and which she knows she needs to tend to so that it does not go out. And Ibram Kendi, he spoke honestly about how our approach to racism might be a little misguided. He was pretty frank about that. 
It's not about changing hearts and minds, he said. That's good work, but it's not the work that is going to change the world. Because the powerful people, the ones who want to keep people disenfranchised, they have their minds made up. And so we need to focus on getting them out of power and building power for those that share our values and our liberatory agenda. I know liberals have an icky relationship with power, he said. But you're going to have to get over that if you really want to change the world. Where in your life do you have power and resources, he asked us. And how are you using that power and those resources to change things? And how can liberals and anti-racists be more strategic about what it's going to take to change entire systems and not just hearts and minds? Because the conservatives have been strategically behind the scenes plotting out a course that uplifts their agenda for decades and generations, changing laws and stacking courts and gerrymandering districts. And we have been trying to change hearts and minds. It was a very thought-provoking talk. And his book is going right to the top of my reading list. Now, in between these worship services and lectures and votes, I was exploring Portland. But I have to say, it was not the city that I expected or had been looking forward to. The beautiful, funky, organic, art-filled city that I expected to visit is now, well, pretty ugly. It's full of garbage and boarded up businesses and homeless encampments everywhere. Tents and couches and grills fill the sidewalks, making it hard to get around. The Apple store looks like a high security prison with giant metal gates surrounding it while business goes on inside. Hand scribbled signs that say, go away, are tacked to makeshift shelters outside the famed locally sourced restaurants. My friend explained to me that a rule has been put in place that no one can be displaced from a tent because there is nowhere to go. And how can you displace someone when there is nowhere to send them? So encampments have spread to sidewalks, to the medians on the sides of highways, to town and private property. The police have taken on a different role since the massive protests against police shootings after George Floyd's murder. Funding has been shifted to a behavioral health unit which can respond to crises relating to mental illness and addiction without the escalation of an armed police presence. It is a model of police reform. And yet, there is rising crime, violence and theft and vandalism. And coupled with a pandemic and an influx of even more homeless folks, the city simply can't keep up. There are not enough resources. There's garbage everywhere. 7,000 homeless people live hand-to-mouth existences in full view. They are camping out in unsanitary and unsafe conditions. 70% of pedestrians killed by cars in Portland in 2021 were homeless people. After a series of accidents and deaths, Portland's mayor recently barred people from setting up tents on the on-ramps and off-ramps to highways. But although they are removed from that danger, there is still no safe place for them to go. Most have just moved paces away to other dangerous roadsides. The availability of shelter beds pales in comparison to the need, and affordable housing 
is even harder to find in this gentrifying city. One of my Uber drivers during the week has lived in Portland for 60 years and shook his head at the state of the city. He had sympathy for the homeless, he said, most of them anyway, but he is heartbroken at what Portland has become. It's unrecognizable to him. There is still beauty there, of course. The rose garden was in full bloom. I gazed up at the Portlandia sculpture, visited the beautiful bronze tree in the children's library, and I did get that salt and straw ice cream cone, and it was delicious. I chose pear and blue cheese in a waffle cone. It was worth every cent and the wait in line. I had fun visiting several food trucks and driving to a waterfall and to an island where they grow strawberries. My friend and I got a half a flat of them at a farm and they were better than any store-bought strawberries I've ever tasted. But the downtown is changed in a way that seems impossible to heal. And the people there are angry. The longtime, maybe more conservative residents who have watched their city change to be unrecognizable and whose businesses have been boarded up, and the young progressives who firmly believe the Democratic Party has abandoned them and given up on their dearly held values. While we were in Portland for General Assembly, the Supreme Court voted to overturn Roe versus Wade. I traveled downtown for a large protest, and Reverend Susan Frederick Gray, our UUA president, went to and was one of the speakers. She did a wonderful job talking about how our religious values call us to support the right to control our own bodies and that abortion is health care. She spoke passionately and angrily. She channeled all her rage into a very moving message. And then a series of younger people from Portland spoke. And they were mad too. But their rage went deeper. Their rage was at all the systems, not just the Supreme Court, which they want to abolish. They want to burn it all down. And like a phoenix, let something better rise from the ashes. Their passion was moving and scary. What would it look like to watch institutions crumble? Maybe it would look something like downtown Portland. I watched myself curiously as my liberal politics, which I hold in theory, were measured up against the reality of defunding the police and prioritizing the rights of the unhoused and decrying all government. Was I conservative? Gross. These thoughts and ideas and questions were still swirling around my head as I moved from the conference hotel over to my friend's home for a visit with her and her family at the close of General Assembly. One evening, we decided to go out to dinner. She has two young sons, so we chose our restaurant carefully. It was called Mick. Menemans, and this very Portland institution takes over historic or interesting buildings that are no longer serving their original purpose and turns them into restaurants and pubs. This one was in an old elementary school that they have turned into a hotel and restaurant. It happens to be the elementary school that my friend's mother went to as a child. It's got a beautiful courtyard and crazy lamps hanging everywhere, interesting art in every nook and cranny. You can see the old vestiges of the school, 
but it's also been transformed into a magical place to explore and have dinner. We sat down to order, and then my friend's husband took the restless toddler for a walk around while we entertained the five-year-old at the table and waited for our food. Our appetizer arrived just as my friend's husband came back with a worried look on his face. There's something wrong, he said. Their young son's forehead was very hot, and his neck was frozen at a strange angle like he couldn't hold up his head. This is really bad, my friend said, her face transforming with worry. A fever and stiff neck are signs of meningitis. We have to bring him to the hospital. I didn't know any of the signs of meningitis, but I knew that it was time to go. We packed up the table, explained things to the waiter. He brought a manager over who was very kind and told us, forget about the bill, just get going to the hospital. The five-year-old didn't quite understand why we were leaving without eating any dinner, but he was happy enough with his sippy cup of lemonade that they had delivered, so we just brought that with us as we rushed to the car. My friends were visibly shaken, but trying to stay upbeat as they strapped both boys into their car seats and set course for the children's emergency room at the local hospital. Partway there, the older boy spilled his lemonade in his lap, and started to cry. My friend, anchored in between two car seats because I was in the front, told him not to worry, it would be okay. It's not water, her son shouted back to her through his tears. It's lemonade, it's not okay. <laughs> Perhaps he was picking up on the stress of the moment and expressing it sideways, but more likely, he was viewing the world through a five-year-old's worldview, where your needs are the most important at all times, no matter what is going on around you. Being able to weigh your needs up against someone else's and to assess a hierarchy of a group's needs comes much later in human development. The adults at the table knew that a child's illness trumps dinner plans, or spilled lemonade. But in his mind, it was a crisis that deserved attention. We dropped my friends and their feverish child off at the ER, and I took the five-year-old home, made him some mac and cheese, watched a little Encanto, got him into his pajamas, and read to him the book that I had brought as a present, The Mysterious Tadpole. Oh, and about seven other books. <laughs> we both love the story of Stregonona, it turns out, which he can recite from memory. His exhausted parents came home hours later. The doctor did not think that it was meningitis or COVID, but another virus he had probably picked up at daycare. He was to stay home, drink plenty of fluids, take something to bring the fever down. The next day, the pediatrician praised my friend for knowing the warning signs of meningitis and told her she had done the exact right thing, going to the ER. But over the next few days, her son slowly began to feel better. For some reason, I thought about their five-year-old's reaction in the car, and it made me think of my own reaction to Portland. I wanted to explore and eat my $8 ice cream and have fun in a city that I have always wanted to visit. But I was intensely bothered by the homelessness and the boarded up buildings and the constant requests for money and the anger. I was struggling to jostle my own needs for beauty and for a vacation with others' real needs for survival for food and shelter, for justice. And I thought about our religious conference and the people picketing outside in support of their fringe candidates. They had needs too, I realized. They wanted their religious home to offer them comfort instead of always challenging them, pushing them, sometimes shaming them. 
They wanted things to feel like they used to because predictability is also a human need. They wanted to feel a sense of power and ownership. But inside the convention center, we were hearing a different group of needs. We were centering voices of color, trans voices, voices of people with disabilities, people who were crying out for safety and security in their religious home who also yearned for a sense of belonging in a denomination that has been pushing them to the side for so long, asking them to assimilate rather than express their full selves, telling them in overt and subtle ways that they should not lead, hold power, be respected and esteemed. It's not just five-year-olds that sometimes have a hard time navigating their own needs in an environment where someone else's needs have to take precedence. The eighth rung of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the most complex level, the one that came later, is the needs which extend beyond the personal self. Those that connect us with the divine, with nature, those that put us in service to others as a purpose higher than fulfilling our own individual needs. Communities of faith fit into this last category. But the thing is, when we show up in faith communities, we bring all our other needs with us, don't we? When we show up in the world, trying to become everything we are capable of being, trying to self-actualize, we bring all our other lesser needs with us. We want to be the best citizen, friend, community member, spiritual being that we can be. And underneath that highest need, we also crave and worry about Food, safety, connection, belonging, status, prestige, meaning, predictability, and beauty. We also spill our lemonade and are upset about it. We also long for societal ills to be corrected, not just so that others are secure, but so that we can enjoy beautiful, sensual experiences without the backdrop of raw, unsanitized poverty or injustice or war. We also want our faith community to comfort us and not just challenge us. As Joseph Santos Lyons reminded us at GA, the first sign of human community was the mending of a broken bone. Years ago, the anthropologist Margaret Mead was asked by a student what she considered to be the first sign of civilization in a culture. The student expected Mead to talk about clay pots, tools for hunting, grinding stones, or religious artifacts, but no. Mead said that the first evidence of civilization was a 15,000 years old fractured femur found in an archaeological site. A femur is the longest bone in the body linking the hip to the knee. In societies without the benefits of modern medicine, it takes about six weeks of rest for a fractured femur to heal. This particular bone had been broken and had healed Mead explained that in the animal kingdom, if you break a leg, you die. You can't run from danger. You can't drink or hunt for food. Wounded in this way, you are meat for your predators. No creature survives a broken leg long enough for the bone to heal. A broken femur that has healed is evidence that another person has taken time to stay with the fallen has bound up the wound, has carried the person to safety, and has tended them through recovery. A healed femur indicates that someone has helped a fellow human 
rather than abandoning them to save their own life. That a fellow human has put this other person's needs above their own to fulfill a higher purpose. Helping someone else through difficulty is where civilization starts, Margaret Mead said. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. For indeed, that's all who ever have. Spirit of life, divine mother of many names and one abundant love, we come to this moment from many places, thousands of stories, thousands of storms, flying 1,000 miles an hour on this one rock. We come full of ideas and excitement, new connections. We come with rage, fear, loneliness. We come with something to give. We come needing something, but not even sure what that is. And even if we are overwhelmed by all of this, we are so grateful to be here. So grateful to be alive. Grateful for the people who surround us. We give thanks for this moment. Let us rest here in your embrace. In this loving embrace, may we find an ease that tempts us not into shutting out the world, not denying it, not fixing it all by ourselves. Lead us to rest, to be held, to hold, to not know, to try anyway, to love, to take delight, to rise again and again, to co-create the world. May we find this place and this people of welcome and belonging. May we be that place and those people. Amen. And blessed be. You sure do know how to welcome a girl home. Thank you. It's become our practice to pose a question based on the theme of the service each week. It can be a topic for sharing out on the lawn today or with friends during the week. If you want to delve deeper into this conversation, we hope you can join us Tuesday at 5 at our Zoom coffee hour. Our question this week is, what need is crying out to you today, either yours or that of another? What need is crying out to you today? Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you for joining us this morning. I'll end with these closing words by Reverend Bill Sinkford, who offered the opening worship at General Assembly. Alone, our vision is too limited to see all that must be seen, and our strength too limited to do all that must be done. Together, there is more hope and more help for all of us on this small blue planet. Yes, go in peace. Mm -hmm.